Well, uh, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jonathan McRae. It's Science Week and this is the Festival of Farming and Food. We're having a fantastic week here uh, and thank you so much for joining us at this event. Uh, it's all thanks to Science Foundation Ireland to fund Science Week and this event and Chagask. We'll be here for the next hour uh, speaking with scientists from Chagask who work in a variety of roles. They all have one thing in common, that the work that they do benefits the environment. We'll find out a little bit about their career paths and what it took to get them from where you might be in your school to where they are now. Very excited, as we know, there's lots of classes joining us from up and down the country. So we want to hear from you. If you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function and we will get to as many of those as we can. We want to hear what school you're from and what part of the country you're from and your question uh, for our panelists who come from a really wide range of research areas. So we really, really interesting to hear their stories. Um, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, they are Deirdre Hennessy, a senior research officer in the grassland department at Chagas Moor Park, working with white clover for milk production. Deirdre is also a funded investigator in the SFI DAFM funded Vista Milk Research Center. Siobhan Cavanagh is a communications and engagement specialist for the Signpost program, which is the first program of its kind to bring everyone involved in farming together, uh, the stakeholders in farming to support uh, the, the, the practice. Farmers, uh, Francis McHugh, Farmers, Farmers McHugh. Uh, Francis McHugh is a forestry development officer at Chagas. She works with landowners who are interested in trees, whether a small native woodland area or a larger forest, which will be delivering multiple benefits to the country from improving biodiversity to capturing carbon and providing wood for our homes and buildings. And uh, finally, Nora O'Shea is a research officer in the Food, Chemistry and Technology Department at Chagas Moor Park. Her research program focuses on digitalizing dairy production uh, and processing and uh, ensuring final product quality, for example, making skim milk powder and that sort of thing. She's also a funded investigator in the SFI DAFM funded Vista Milk Research Center. Uh, we want to hear from you, as I say, so uh, get your questions in. Don't forget to name your, your school and where you're from. And if you're on social, uh, do Chagask, uh, do tag, tag us at Chagask. It's hard to say, uh, but it's just at Chagask is the, the hash, is the, the handle to use. So um, we'd love to hear from you from up and down the country. Uh, if you're on social, just tag us at Chagask. Okay, so uh, let's get into it then, shall we? And we'll start with you, Deirdre, if you don't mind. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, Thanks, tell everybody. us. Tell us a little bit about uh, you growing up. What interested you in science as a child? Did you have a, a sort of inspiring teacher? Was there a moment under a tree or, or what, what made you interested in, in research? Yeah, um, so I grew up on a dairy farm and I um, just loved working with animals. Um, and I'm the eldest of seven. So it was always preferable to be outside in the yard milking or feeding calves than to be inside having to help with housework. So I suppose because I was interested, it was easy for me to be outside. Then in secondary school, I really enjoyed chemistry and biology, probably because of the teacher we had who made it interesting and engaging. Do you remember um, the name of the teacher? I, yeah, uh, Mrs. Brownlow. She was super teacher in the Ursuline Secondary School in Blackrock. Um, really enjoyed her, particularly chemistry uh, uh, classes, really liked them. But I was fascinated by biology and the whole thing of about how plants grow and, you know, cell growth and, and so on. Um, but more so the interaction then with the environment as well uh, and the influence that plants have on the environment and the influence that the environment has on plants. But look, I still didn't really know where I wanted to go, Jonathan, after school and in transition year, we had a really good transition year programme which allowed us to explore careers. And I found with the help of my career guidance teacher, um agricultural science in UCD and just sounded fascinating sounded like something I wanted to do and I went from there and my interest in research then came through the professional work placement part of um ag, ag science in UCD which I cannot recommend enough you know take it's great to have the opportunity to get work experience and to see how things how things work in the real in the real world and what the different roles are in the real world and that's where my interest in research came from i spent about five months here at chagas in moor park working in the grassland department with uh dr michael o'donovan who's the head of grassland now um and i just i just thought what they were doing for those that period while i was here in the spring summer 
so interesting. And I never knew, ever knew that this type of job existed until I did my professional work experience. And look, I was lucky from there then uh, I got a PhD. Um, so that was my goal then going into fourth year, final year in college was to get a postgrad master's or a PhD. And I was just lucky that one came along. Um, and at the end of that, I was lucky I ended up back here in the grassland department in Moore Park. Um, I just wanted to work with grassland. Um, it doesn't work out for everybody that they get to do what they really want to do and that they get to identify it so early. But I just was lucky um, and I still love my job. So, I mean, I always find it really interesting that people, you know, in in Chagas, once you get to a level that you're at, Deirdre, they're working on really specific things. You're working on white clover for yeah. milk production. And I'm just wondering, how does it get that specific? I mean, how did you go, oh, that's what I'm going to do? How does that area of research come about? Yeah. So I suppose when I start, when I did my PhD, Jonathan, it wasn't on white clover. It was on grass and how grass grows and what affects it, and particularly over the winter. So I was really interested in the plant. But while I was doing my PhD, like you, you have to read uh, other research and you go to conferences and you see what's going on elsewhere. And like this whole clover thing fascinated me that you have this plant that's almost like a little, it works like a little machine or a little factory in the soil and it makes a relationship with bacteria that can fix nitrogen to feed the plant and then it just makes more nitrogen available and it can, it can, it can reduce the amount of fertilizer that needs to be applied. Then if, so then when I started working in Moor Park, I wasn't working in, in this area. I was still working in grassland. But over time, you know, there became became obvious that there was a requirement to do some work in this area. And it's, right. you know, an important area in terms of the environment and reducing our inputs and making better use of our natural resources. And look, it came, you know, we had a discussion as a department here and, and I put my hand up and said, like, this is something I'd really like to do. Is there an opportunity for me to, to start working in this area? And it started, you know, in a small, small little bit of research, small part of my program. And it's just grown from there because I suppose the great thing about research is you answer one question, but you create so many more questions or you identify so many more. That would be very frustrating for me at times. But you do get you do get an answer to one question, Jonathan, but it opens the door to more. And then you can say, right, OK, we know this now. Let's figure out how, you know, how that is influencing what we know is happening or why what we why this is happening. It's really interesting. Um, and it's just about, you know, reading, um, talking to people and understanding what understanding what has been done before um, and identifying the gaps. And there's always going to be requirements from farmers to, you know, look at the system and maybe see, can we improve some things for happening in the system? And then there's other, you know, policy and government directives and so on. That means changes have to be made. Yeah. We have to support the farmers in doing that and do the research so that they have the confidence then in implementing something. And when you're talking to Siobhan in a few minutes, like she's taking the research then from us uh, and working with the farmers to use it. Uh, before we go to Siobhan, can I ask you one more question? And that is, what is a day to day for you? Like, are you out in the in the in the field? Are you usually in a lab? Are you having meetings? What is the the life of a, of, of a, a Chagas senior research officer working in White Clover? It's all of what you said, Jonathan. So, for example, I have a grazing trial here at Moor Park. So I have a herd of cows. I have paddocks. We manage the cows. We collect milk data. We collect grass samples, clover samples. We bring them into the lab. We get dry matter. We get clover contents and so on. Uh, I supervise at the moment two PhD students, so I work really closely with them. Um, I have meetings and webinars like this, uh, project meetings. I'm involved in some European funded projects, so there's some travel associated with that. I go to a few conferences um, and I also lecture a little bit. So my I have no two days ever that are the same. Um, and it, you know, that just keeps work interesting all the time. Yeah, no, I, no, I have a similar job where I, I'm doing all sorts of things in all different ways uh, during the week. And it just makes every week different. And I love it. Uh, Siobhan, um, you are a communications and engagement specialist for the Signpost program. Um, how did you get uh, involved in that? What was your interest as a, as a young girl? What was your interest in the world? 
Yeah, so li quite similar to Deirdre up to a point. So I come from a farming background as well, a mixed farm. So we would have had uh, dry stock, uh, a tillage and sheep. So we we quite a mixed What's farm. Dry stock now, I'm really sorry. Dry stock. So we didn't we didn't have suckler suckler cows at, at that stage. We used to buy in cattle, grow them on, and finish them. So we used to buy in I dairy see. calves um, and grow them on and finish them through to through to slaughter. So it's wet stock it, because they come out wet. Is that the? Sorry, no. <laughs> dry stock. So you have milking cows, which are your dairy cows, which is what the farm dairy comes back from. And dry dry animals are animals that don't you don't milk. So yeah. they're they're suckler cows. They're, they're or cattle it's they, they, they don't you don't make them um so i think for for me living on a farm i was a bit like deirdre i didn't like housework any opportunity to get away from washing up or hoovering or ironing i was out the door to be on the farm and i think when you come from a mixed farm like that you get the opportunity to, to see plants growing you get the opportunity to see animals being born we had a poultry farm um we had um, we had a hatchery actually, so we would have hatched out uh, thousands of eggs every week. Every week, so you got to see an awful lot of variety on the farm, which you questioned and you tried to understand what was happening, and that would have given me a huge interest in you know the whole area of how things function. Yeah. And I was very lucky as well in primary school. I had a teacher that was very interested in nature projects and we spent a lot of time doing nature projects. So I could often be seen out on the hedgerows around home measuring the lengths of buds and that type of thing where we were looking at, at spring growth. Um, and I remember in, in sixth class, we did a project with Antashka. Sorry, it was a competition. It was a nature project. And I was the lead person in the class on it. And we actually won that year. And I got a huge, and I still remember the buzz that I got out of being involved in that project in the nature. And that kind of gave, that did give me an interest in, in, um, in science. So in secondary school, I studied biology and, and chemistry, similar to Deirdre. And I suppose the biology would have been my preferred, just understanding how, how thing, things function, whether it be animals or, or plants. I, a little bit different to Deirdre, agricultural science wouldn't have been my per, first preference in terms of going to college. I wanted to be a vet, and there's a lot of ags that would, uh, have been in the same boat, wanted to do a veterinary, but maybe didn't have the brains to get to, get to, to veterinary. So that Stop would us. be first, first on my CAO, but uh, agriculture was, science was second on it. Very good. And so tell me what you do now, because this is a communications role in a way. Uh, what, what is your work um, involved in and, uh, and what do you do? Yeah, so I'm communications and engagement specialist for the Signpost programme. And just to explain what the Signpost programme is, it's um, a Chagas leg programme. And it brings together all the people that are involved in the agricultural sec sector. So the milk processors, so the likes of Tirlon and um, Dairy Gold and all of those, the meat processors and the farm organizations, um, farmers. It's bringing out every, together everybody that's involved in the agricultural sector to try and support farmers to take the actions needed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a target to reduce our emissions by 25%. And by bringing everybody in the industry together, we're, we're hoping to achieve that through science. I suppose we're, we're trying to find the solutions through science that we can achieve that. And so my role then, and Deirdre has, has touched on it there, is my role is to link the research solutions that the likes of Deirdre are developing, so the Clover solution, packaging that into a format that farmers can use it. So it's wanting developing the solutions at a research centre, but then we have to get that out to farm level. And I'm, I suppose, the link and the people that work with me in the specialist core are the link between the researchers and the practitioners, which is the farmers. So we repackage or we package the, the research outcomes and present them in front of farmers to encourage them to adopt the technologies. One of the things that we're doing in the programme is we have 120 demonstration farms across the country. And basically, these demonstration farmers are farms that are adopting the technologies earlier than others. So they're they're putting clover into their swords, they're using protected urea, they're reducing the amount of chemical nitrogen they're using. They're adopting all the technologies that we want farmers to do. Yeah. And what I liken them to is operation transformation, basically. So on operation transformation, you have six inspirational leaders. And they are doing all the things that they, they need to do to, to um, improve their health. Um, and our signpost farms or our demonstration farms are the same. So they're the early adopters. And what we want to do is then leverage what they're doing to inspire all farmers to adopt those technologies. And that's where I spend most of my, my time is repackaging the science, but also telling the stories of these farmers and the great work that they're doing to try and inspire all farmers to adopt the technologies. 
Get your questions in, please. Uh, do tell us what school you're, you're sending your questions from and whereabouts you are in the country. We would love to get your questions. Use the Q&A tool. That's what this session is for, is to answer as many of your questions as possible. So start now, please. Um, okay, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, Francis, um, you are a forestry development officer with Chagask. What got you interested in trees? Although who doesn't love trees? What a great well, job you have. <laughs> This is it, Jonathan. And uh, I, I, there's definitely a running theme here of big, big families. I, I'm the youngest of nine and uh, definitely I can identify with the other two, two ladies there in relation to uh, getting out of the house. Um, but yeah, I think it, it is. Uh, it is interesting, really, to, to see that common theme there. And I suppose who influenced us at a very young age to kind of uh, eventually go in a particular direction. Um, and yeah, similarly, <clears throat> I would give credit, credit to my, my parents who would have been very much um, encouraging, encouraging us to kind of appreciate nature, you know, keeping an eye on the seasons, what was coming, what was going um, in the context of a, of a mixed farm as well. So very much that as well. Um, I went on to do, um, I suppose, science subjects as well at school. Um, another, I suppose, turning point was the fact that I got um, a summer job in Oak Park in Carlow. I was <clears throat> living not too far away from it. And um, so in the research centre there. So that was, I suppose, I look back on those as very kind of like maybe rose tinted glasses, but it seemed to be very hot summers and gorgeous outdoor weather. Um, and I remember specifically a day that there was a helicopter on site doing some measuring on sugar beet and I was allowed to go on the helicopter. That was just the coolest thing ever. So, mm -hmm. um, Nothing to do with trees yet, but at least uh, it was definitely the kind of the, the science aspect and the outdoors and kind of the appreciation of how things grow and how things work. Um, the forestry part of it, again, I suppose, was a little bit like Siobhan. It wasn't something that I went directly, this is what I want to be, um, but I definitely wanted to do ag science. And when I went into ag science, I very much saw forestry as something Kind of new something different it was it was very much a kind of an exciting time for private forestry where there was grants and premiums and a lot of farmers were getting involved so i like that whole idea of i suppose land use people making decisions about how they farm and there being other options and you know we were beginning to hear and we very much know now in relation to the environment and biodiversity and carbon that was showing my age now but that was a very kind of a new new thing if you like um so, and I suppose the whole idea of farmers getting involved um, rather than it just being forestry, quilt, you know, that that's all, that was the story from start to finish. It was kind of a, an interesting time where, you know, landowners are making a decision to, to plant some land. So, yeah, that's how I, I, I ended up in forestry. Very good. And so tell me a little bit about your work then and, and how you um, how you go about it. What is your typical day like? Yeah, again, similar to the others, there, there's great variety. Um, I'm a forestry development officer. So because of that, I suppose I'm and, and uh, being with Quilcha or being, being with Chagask, I'm I'm usually talking to farmers um, and it's around that decision to plant, you know, to change agricultural land to forestry pretty much overnight is, is a big decision. We, we all know we need more trees. We all know we need to increase the amount of forestry in Ireland. But it will be down to individual landowners to make that decision to to permanently change their land or part of their land to to trees. So that's a, that's no small thing. So yeah. really, a lot of my job is talking, uh, I suppose, around kitchen tables, you know, going out to farms and, and chatting in terms of understanding where people are coming from and explaining to them, I suppose, the impact of trees and. Um, the benefits, the I suppose the grants and the payments that are there, obviously that that help along the way, um, but also how trees will help and, and interact, I suppose, on the rest of the farm and how how hopefully um, as a result, you know, it will be a, a better farm for it, you know, so at whatever scale and farmers. Um, are very varied in terms of their objectives in relation to forestry and um, some people come at it from a completely environmental point of view, which is fantastic others with a more kind of uh, economic you know hat on and mm. but the vast majority will have will have an awareness of all those kind of multiple benefits and the kind of potential and they're, they're trying to understand how, well how might this fit into my patch of land you know yeah I, well i'm going to drill a bit deeper into the environmental aspect um in a bit but i wanted to get to nora just to say we've got our first question in from Mount mercy college orla i'll get to that uh, after we've heard from nora uh, but do keep your uh, questions coming into us. Uh, thanks to see them coming in now. Um, Nora, tell me a little bit about your childhood and your interest in science. What did you come from a big family on the farm as well? 
Um, no, so I suppose I have a bit of a different background. Um, I'm from County Kerry and where we live in Kerry wouldn't have the best land <laughs> for having cows on. So beautiful no, I wouldn't. Place nonetheless. Very picturesque, very beautiful, perfect for sheep and fishing, but probably not ideal for beef cows or dairy cows. So no, um, I don't come from a big family. We didn't have a big um, farm such as some of the other ladies have mentioned. Um, I, I suppose I don't know what I specifically say. I had a specific interest or there was a moment in time as a child where I said, OK, yeah, I love science. I did have an interest in science, but um, I suppose really it wasn't until I got to secondary school and I did specific subjects like home economics and biology where I found and in particularly in home economics, um, I really enjoyed like food safety aspects like microbiology and I suppose some of the science about how food is made. But would I say that specifically made me say, OK, yeah, I want to do food business. No, I wouldn't say that. I was quite young when I started college. I was 17, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was fortunate that I fell into a um, bachelor's degree that looked at both science subjects and business marketing subjects in UCC called food business. Um, from there, I did realize that I really enjoyed food science. Like I really enjoyed it. So I then went on and pursued a master's in food science. And there, there is a research aspect where you have a, a research project. Um, and I was fortunate to have a brilliant supervisor and she's still in UCC, Professor Elka Arendt. Um, and from there, I suppose I really enjoyed the modules and some brilliant lecturers there. I kind of thought it was a recession, so there wasn't great prospects. So I took the year out and went traveling for, for 12 months. So we went great around the world and we went to Australia for six months working, but then we we're in South America, we were in Asia, New Zealand. Nice. So we really enjoyed ourselves. And I was fortunate while I was away to be, to be asked to attend an interview for a PhD in food science. So from there, I did a PhD. I was offered to do a PhD in Chagas in collaboration with UCC under um, Emer Gallagher and Elka Arendt. So I didn't get to where I am today kind of based on what I did as a child, but definitely probably influenced what I where I am today. But I wouldn't specifically say that because I was living on a farm or from a farm that that's what I'm doing. So uh, really interesting, and it's great to hear a different perspective because um, one person uh, has asked, uh, this is uh, Orla McCarthy from Mount Mercy College saying, do you have to be from a farm to do well in this job? And the answer is is, is clearly no, but we'll maybe, um, you can. I'll, I'll get to you Deirdre on that in a sec. Um, so uh, Nora, just tell me a little bit about what you do day to day. Um, so because yours is a very different role to the others because you're working at digitizing um, the dairy proce uh, processing. and, and Maybe you might tell us a little bit about what, what you mean by dairy processing and what your role is. Yeah, so when we're talking about dairy processing, we're talking about the major steps involved in producing a dairy product. So, um, for example, I think you mentioned in my intro skim milk powder. So there's a number of steps involved. We bring in raw milk, we might apply a heat treatment, and then we might move on to evaporation where we're moving water from the milk to make it more thick, essentially. And then yeah. we move on using a spray dryer. So we're basically removing excess moisture that you end up with a powder. So a lot of my role would look at different instruments and sensors that can be put into the pipes during those different steps that can give information back to dairy processors such as Dairy Gold, Tirlan, Lakeland Dairies. And essentially what we're doing and what I mean by digitalizing is using these sensors to give more data about their process so they can make more informed decisions and then tying all these crucial steps together to give them that information in a more meaningful manner. So it might necessarily be like yards and yards of data. It could be snapshots of different parts of that process. Um, so, and then in terms of what I'm doing from a day to day, so I would have a number of projects. They could be looking at these sensors. So it could be a sensor for look at how much protein, fat, lactose is in the raw milk, or it could be looking at that evaporation step where we want to know how thick the milk has become. So we'd use a viscometer sensor there. And again, the whole idea is so that we're able to optimize the process and make it a more sustainable process and give the information to the processors so that they can make these decisions with more knowledge behind them. 
Um, and I suppose the other aspects then would be, you know, I have an amazing group of PhD students and they would carry out a lot of the research. So we would meet together on a daily basis. So similar to Deirdre, like I don't have one, two days that are the same. It would involve meetings, discussing projects, meeting the students one on one, discussing their papers, discussing their findings, going through studies. Um, it could be going to open days where we're talking to dairy processors to show them what we're working on. It could be more private meetings with dairy processors where we're getting feedback because a lot of our research, we like it to be applied. Mm. So, you know, we want to get kind of feedback as, to, okay, is this something of interest? Will this help their process? Um, so yes, that's kind of from a day to day. That's what I would do. Very good. And um, in, in, when you talk about optimizing, do you mean, with these sensors what sort of changes might you do like reduce the amount of heat required and save exactly. energy that way that sort of thing exactly it might need to be you know heated for that long um you know so you'd be looking at things like how much energy for for pumping it you know so if it's too viscous you need to pump it for longer you might need more pump energy so right. looking at measuring the viscosity from that aspect but then how much energy are the bumps pumps consuming are do we need to heat certain things for as long as they're being heated or okay. is there issues in the process that we weren't aware of? So you're streamlining and optimizing the processing of, of the foods all along the way to try and get the same high quality product, but with low cost and low energy output. Really interesting. Uh, okay, keep your questions coming in. Deirdre, do you have to um, be in a farm uh, to, to do well at this job? You're muted there. Sorry, Jonathan. My no. uh, the long, the short answer and the long answer is absolutely not, Jonathan. You don't have to be from a farm. Lots of people I went to college with and did ag science with were not from a farm, but they had a big interest in agriculture or animals or how plants grow or that kind of thing. Um, I've had PhD students who weren't from a farm and they were super PhD students. Um, you don't even have to have studied agricultural science to do uh, to, to work in Chagask. You know, we have PhD students here who are not from an agricultural science background. They're from some other area of science, but not agricultural science. Mm. Um, and that that student that I just mentioned who worked with me, PhD student, wasn't from um, a farm. Um, but now she has a job as a grassland researcher in Chagask. So, you know, the sky's the limit. If you're interested and you work at something, you can do whatever you want. Um, yeah. You know, and there's so much information. There are so many people who can help you along the way. Um, you know, so like, say, for example, you start work here in Moorpark with us or in any of the Chagask centres. There's so many people in the in the centre who can help you, support you, give you a steer, give you a hand. It's unbelievable. There's brilliant, brilliant team work in Chagask and loads of support. So you don't at all have to come from a farm to to find a path in agriculture. Yeah, and and I suppose what we're learning from social science research is a mix of people is yeah. always good. I, I think one of the reasons why I've been lucky enough to hold on to my job for as long as possible is because I I didn't study science, and so I have the stupid questions such as why do we call it wet suck? And um, <laughs> Siobhan, uh, you wanted to say something on that. Um, no, I totally agree. The same as Deirdre. I think um, I've lots of friends that don't come from an agriculture or an agricultural background at all, and they've excelled. And like you say, diversity is good because they, yeah. somebody that's from a non-farming background can bring a very different perspective to the conversation. So, yeah, I think it's 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 what you're passionate about. And I know when I um, decided to study agriculture or when I was thinking about it, I would have contacted a number of people in the industry to see was it a good idea or a bad idea. And at the time, and a lot of the people that are listening to this wouldn't have even been born. This was in 1984. And I was told, no, agriculture is on its knees. Don't go into that industry. It's an industry that's struggling. But wow. I was passionate about it and wanted to go in. So I think you have to follow your passion, whatever it is. And the career will come. I think you take your opportunities then as they come along. So regardless of what your background is, if it's something you're passionate about, just go with it. And you have to see, heed some of the advice, but I ignored that advice that it was a bad industry. And I have done, I would consider I've done reasonably okay in it since. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you find something that you enjoy doing and you you enjoy doing well at, you're likely to do well if you enjoy doing yeah. it. And then as a result, 
you uh, you get these opportunities open to you if you're the sort of person who looks around for opportunities. Yeah, now, and you may you not sure. necessarily, just to, maybe to finish on that, I think you may not necessarily have your career path. Like people ask me, oh, did you know that you always wanted to be in communications in Chagas? And I go, no, I did I want to be a regional manager? No, did I want to be a, a nutrition specialist when I was a nutrition specialist? And I think what you do is you take the opportunities as they come along. So decide where your passion is. But then as time progresses, you get the opportunities to do something a little bit different outside of the day to day role. And that opens doors for you to go different directions. So, yeah, I, I don't think don't, I wouldn't worry about having a grand plan starting off because just take the opportunities as they come is what I'd say. Absolutely agree. And I had no idea I'd end up be doing this job. And I was very confused filling out my CAO form. I actually um, I crossed out all the courses I didn't want to do and I was left with one, which is communications in DCU. I, it's not that I wanted to do it. It was just one I didn't actively not want to do. Um, so she wanted another question for you. Was it a big jump to move into a communications role? And did you do any extra courses or training for it? OK, so um, I would have built up a lot of skills through the jobs that I had running up to that. So I did a PhD in pig nutrition in Moorpark. So I would have developed a skill set there in terms of writing a thesis and communications. And I had set up on numerous platforms, both scientific and in front of farmers. Um, writing for popular, popular publications through my PhD, I would have had to do a certain amount of that. I was nutrition specialist for 14 years, so a very similar type of role, but it was specifically on nutrition. So I was room <coughs> nutrition specialist for Chagask. And that was doing the same type of job in that taking the research out to the research centers, repackaging it and making it available to our advisors and farmers. And then more recently, I was regional manager within Chaga. So I was seven years as a regional manager in two different regions. And that has given me great insight into how you engage farmers. How do you encourage farmers to adopt technologies? So I think through my career, I had built up a skill set that made the transition into being communication specialist relatively easy. Now, I know the communications had moved on in terms of social media and, and the digital platforms, and that's where I'm learning at the moment. So we have great support within the organization um, with our PR department, but I'm also planning on doing a course specifically on social media next year. I haven't done anything to date, I'm kind of working with the skills I have, but um, there is good support. And, and I suppose that kind of demonstrates you might start off in a very sciencey role, but end up in a communications role. So it's it's taking the opportunities that become available. And you do build up those skill sets that that will work, that will stand to you then when you do go to change, make it your career path change. Uh, John McGreen says, hello from Loretto Abbey Dalkey. Hello, we're enjoying learning about your jobs and what they entail. So nice to hear from you. Um, I have a question for Francis. Um, and this is from Marilyn, uh, Mary, Marilyn Hedworth Christ King. Gosh, I don't know where that is. Uh, and, and they say, uh, do we need, to, are, are we um, pushing to plant mixed native woodland still or are we still planting coniferous monoculture? Sorry, I messed that question. Okay. I'm trying to find, to find oh, the name okay. of the school. Um, is, there a push to is there a push to plant mixed native woodland or are we still planting coniferous monoculture? Yeah, that's that's a really, it's a good question. Maybe we could spend the last half an hour talking about it. <laughs> I'm probably joking. There's, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, and yeah, the forestry is evolving in Ireland, you know, and, and we're quite we're, we're quite young at this, you know, that in terms of the, our forests are quite young. Um, but the knowledge around forestry um, is, is changing over time. Um, but the type of tree and the type of forest really, it depends on the land available. And in the early stages of forestry in Ireland, um, the land available was quite poor um, and, and it had very limited opportunity in relation to what type of trees. Now the land that's coming into forestry now is, is better. And for that reason, we are open to lots of choice. Um, and in parallel to that, that increased awareness in terms of people, you know, standing back a little bit and saying, well, what do we want in Ireland? What type of forest do we want? And of course, again, in parallel to that, our awareness of, and I think you mentioned it earlier, about kind of variation is good. Mixtures are good in, in any walk of life and including in, in a forest, um, if you have a mixture, you know, you're more sustainable going into future, into the future, you're future proofing your forest. So yeah, the, the short, that was a long answer. The short yeah. bit of it is that, yes, we're, we're kind of moving gradually to more mixed. Um, we don't want to forget about the, the kind of commercial timber production, because if any of you are in your classrooms looking around in terms of what all the products that are, are made from wood, we need wood and wood stores carbon. 
So that's certainly an aspect that we don't want to lose lose a, a vision of. Um, but yeah, mixtures, different forest types, the right forest in the right place, and uh, yeah, find, finding the landowners who are, are willing to, to go down that direction too. Very good. The school is Marlin Hedworth Christ King Girls Secondary, which is why it's difficult okay, to get it all there in Cork. Uh, good to see you. Thanks very much for your question. Um, so uh, uh, this is a question for a few of you. I think Siobhan sort of answered it, but uh, from uh, Kenneth O'Dea in presentation, College Athen Rye, close to Chagask, and they say uh, Chagask are always willing to speak to ag science classes. A few students also work there. Um, a few girls attending the talk and enjoying it so far. Uh, third and fourth and fifth uh, uh, fifth year. Have your guests changed their careers or roles over the years? So Siobhan's kind of touched on that. Uh, what about you, Nora? Have you changed your role uh, over the years? Um, I probably would say I would move more across um, different types of food science, like my PhD and my first research position probably was more in, in cereal science. So um, developing gluten-free formulations and then looking at actually um, Irish wheat and only for oat varieties for making dairy, um, sorry, cereal products. So I moved completely in terms of food science, food groups, I suppose, more so. So I moved from looking at cereals over to dairy products <clears throat> and particularly I'm um, looking at digital technologies for you know, how you can improve how those products are made and ensure that they're high quality products. So I wouldn't specifically say I, I moved careers, but definitely moved food products. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the hardest part of your job? Uh, Rachel Wright asks from Our Ladies Grove. Uh, Nora? Well, that's a good question. Um, in terms of it being the hardest part of our job, well, I suppose we're always quite busy. Um, and as we were saying, our days change you know, from day to day, what we're doing can change quite a lot. So I suppose it's you need to re be a really good planner. You need to be able to say, you know, to keep on top of deadlines, to make sure your projects are running on time. So I wouldn't say it's the hardest part, but definitely it's something that needs to be considered, you know, all the time to ensure because it's not just your own deadlines. You have PhD students and um, you have postdocs. So it's, it's to ensure that their projects and their personal development. So our postdocs here, although they're doing research themselves, they're also doing modules to further develop their own soft skills in their own careers for the future. So you yeah. want to ensure that in Chag like in Chag is a big part of our work as well as to ensure that their career progression continues and in a positive way as well. Um, so yeah, so I suppose planning. Yeah, okay, very good. So planning and, uh, and busyness. Deirdre, what is the hardest part of your job? Uh, I kind of similar to to Nora. I don't I don't think I have like a very hard part of the job, but there is a lot going on. So it's about being organized um, and planning. And I suppose the other thing is making sure that, you know, the research that we're doing uh, can have an impact for the farmer. So it's really important from our point of view that the work we're doing is for the benefit of the industry that we're supporting. And I suppose then I suppose the hard part is how do we package what we what we research so that it can be easily adapted on farm because there's no farmers are busy people they have a lot going on if you want them to change something that they're doing you know what's the best way or the most straightforward way or the easy steps for them to implement so you know there's a little bit of work goes into planning that and planning getting the message out um and that probably takes more time than we realize if we were to sit down and put all that time together so it's a challenge it's not hard part but it's a challenge and you know it's always going to be a challenge because communication is always a challenge mm, very good thanks Deirdre um Siobhan uh we have a question from Elizabeth Sheehan uh she's from uh St Aidan's Tala on a beautiful sunny day she says our students would like to know what is the difference between doing science and medicine in college my first answer to that. Yes. Sure well, it. well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it, I, I suppose uh, broadly, what is the difference between doing science and medicine in college? Um, well, I presume medicine is is more specific. I suppose most of us studied agricultural science, um, and that's specifically. You, you, it, yeah, sorry. When we when we did agricultural science, the first two years was general science, um, yeah. and you kind of went into it going, 
I came here to study agricultural science and I'm studying general science, but you have to get that foundation or that, that the basics right first before you can get specifically into the agricultural side of it. And then the final two years of the course would have been specifically around agriculture and applying the science that we learned in the first two years. I presume probably in medicine, the first couple of years is similar. You do the basics science um, yeah. and then you, you're, you're more specific around the, the medicine piece. Other than that, I don't know what else I can say. About yeah, it. So, so I, I mean, so I suppose it, they both have a similar uh, idea in that they're, they're, you start uh, broader and you, you specialize later on and they're about uh, asking questions. Uh, I suppose there's lots of overlap, of course, um, in the two fields, but uh, medicine, you know, generally tends to, to be regarding uh, improvement of health and yeah. uh you know science can be much broader than that everything from environment to and I suppose within the agriculture and science degree once you get your first two years done you specialize I think it's still that way that you specialize whether it be in like I specialize in animal science I didn't do any crop science I had no interest in crop once mm. I went to college or you you can specialize in in forestry like um Francis did or the environment or food science so there's specialization within ag science as well then once you've got over the first couple of years in the course Thanks very much. Uh, hello to Ursuline College in Sligo. Uh, Rachel Wright is in, back with another question. She says, um, what would be the gender ratio in the Chagas offices? Um, maybe Deirdre, would you answer that one? Yeah, uh, so it depends, uh, Jonathan. So in research, we're probably very much go, getting towards 50-50 male-female in terms of, of um, the research uh, in Chagas, then we on the advisory, it's probably still male dominated, but there are an increasing number of um, female, really good female advisors at that. Um, so in general, I suppose the organization is trying to move to a more gender balanced organization. And we have been involved in an EU project, the little logos up there behind you, Jonathan, the Gender Smart Project, um, which has, I suppose, helped to focus a little bit about uh, gender balance. But look, I, to me, I never worried, ever worried about uh, gender balance. And I suppose when I started research, or when I started working in Moorpark, the gender balance wasn't as good as it is now, but it, it never mattered. No, I don't think anybody ever thought anything less of me being a female researcher compared to my male colleagues and mm. certainly my male colleagues never batted an eyelid you know I was a, I was one of the team I'm one of the researchers and that's it I do my job they do their job and then we you know we come together on the various parts as a team so um I, I would say you know not to for anyone who's worried about the whole oh it's kind of male dominated industry agriculture yeah it is but look it's never going to change if there aren't more females in it and you know all of us have done well in our careers the four the four of us that are here and i don't think well i can't speak for the other three but being a female i don't think has has stopped me being a good researcher and being able to do a phd and so on francis yeah, I suppose um, in, in terms of in, in contrast in relation to the area of work, I'm I'm one of eight foresters in Chagask. I'm one of eight women in <laughs> as well. Uh, the rest are, are male. Actually, the head of the forestry department is is female, which is is great. Um, but but saying that in terms of what Deirdre is saying, absolutely, it doesn't doesn't bother me. It's never a problem as such. Or, but what I do find is, I suppose, when I run meetings and events they they are very much male dominated as well um and it can be an, an issue for some women maybe even just coming to events and kind of knowing that they're going to be 99 percent of the people that are coming are going to be men so that can be a little bit um intimidating it's improving from that point of view and i sometimes people actually women ring me and say oh do you think it will be okay if i come along and i'm like well I'm there, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm a woman, <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just that building that confidence that um, there's absolutely no reason to think that there's uh, any reason to be, you know, uh, any way anxious or, or feel that they're, they're any way different. But um, yeah, in terms of forestry, we'd be, well, we, we really need more foresters, but um, we, we definitely need more female foresters as well. And uh, certainly to try and uh, market that, that uh, I suppose, lifestyle and the opportunities in relation to forestry as um, 
suitable for everybody. And, uh, and, and you know, th this is one of the reasons why we're doing this event to, to encourage um, young uh, girls and young women to consider a career in uh, agricultural uh, science and, and working potentially at, at Chagask because it can be so rewarding and you get so much out of your jobs. Your jobs are so different at the same time. You do you do want to see that organizational change where there's there is uh, you know more women at the highest levels of, of every organization and that i suppose is something that's going to to take time uh as 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 societies change siobhan did you want to comment on that quickly you're you're muted there um just to make the point that if you take agricultural science um, um at university level i think it's 50 50 or maybe even higher numbers higher female numbers doing agricultural science now than males so it's it is changing slowly but but surely and and similar to deirdre and francis i've never had an issue as a female i think once you can do your job i used to think maybe that you maybe had to prove yourself more when you go out to visit a group of farmers, but look at once you can do your job, you're, you're treated the exact same with farmers. There's, and, and regardless, even though we've quite, you know, the average age, age, age of farmers is 57, it, it's, it hasn't had any, hasn't had any impact on me, but that's the only point you want to make just in the ag agricultural faculty, there's as many women, if not more, um, doing ag science at this stage. Thanks, Siobhan. Vanilla Quirk says hello from Graphene. Um... Uh, community college and uh, transition year in Lucan, really enjoying listening to the possibilities for our girls and boys in STEM. So I hope I've got that right. Um, Paula Mariarty says, how much time is spent in the office? Are you out doing experiments a lot? Um, maybe I'll ask Deirdre that first. Um, you know, you covered it a bit, but maybe you might tell us a little bit about that and then maybe Nora. I suppose yeah. Nora, let's Nora. <laughs> It depends on the time of year, Jonathan. It depends on the experiments that are going on. Um, so like the spring, I would say spend a good bit of time outside of the office because it's the start of the year, it's the start of the grass growing season, start of the grazing season. So there's a lot of setting up in that. But it's pro probably for a lot of the year 50-50, uh, but kind of November, December, January is probably predominantly in the office, except for maybe going out to farms to meet farmers or uh, maybe tidying up a small little bit at the end of the year. And there would be time in the lab in that indoor in that indoor part as well. So it hugely depends on what experiments you've running and the time of year. Um, and because we don't do the same experiment for our entire careers, that changes year to year. So not very not a very clear answer probably jonathan but that's the reality it's very much mixed totally depends on nice. variety of things so um I, raise your hand if you want to answer this one because it's uh it, 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 can, I mean, it depends on how you view it but um ursuline college in sligo have a question they say is environmental science a well-paid career what are the working hours like and do you like being a woman in stem so who wants to take that is it a well-paid career <laughs> Everyone's looking around. We all, we'll skip that one then. I, 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 I can make a comment. Good woman, dear. Good woman. God, I thought Is I was it a well paid that. career? It's okay paid once you're once you're in. It's probably a little bit tougher at the start. It depends on who you work for. Yeah. Uh, it's a hugely rewarding career if you if you like science. And I didn't I didn't come in to work uh, in science for the money as such. I mean. Actually, when I when I did the interview for my PhD, one of the senior researchers at the time said to me, oh, you're, you're coming now to do a PhD. You're just finished college. You know, there's a lot of your colleagues are going to be driving nice cars and earning big money. And you'll be a student on a very small stipend that you will just yeah. live on. Are you OK with that? And I, I, I said to him and it was the honest answer. I wanted to do a PhD. I was interested in the science and I wasn't doing it for the money. And he said, yeah. okay, but when you go to work afterwards in science, you probably won't be very well off. And I said, yeah, but I'll be doing something I enjoy. Yeah. And look, I do. Money isn't everything and money doesn't buy happiness. So, you know, if you enjoy what you do, uh, and one of the others said a while ago, I think it was Siobhan, if you enjoy what you do, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not work as such. Um, yeah. And there's huge reward in that and there's huge job satisfaction. And I, I think the girls asked, do you like work, being a woman in STEM? Yeah, I do. Nora? Yeah, just to add to what Deirdre said, um, I think one of the reasons why I really enjoy my job is because it varies so much. 
and because you know we have access to and we're and some of that is down to us okay applying for funding and securing funding to buy different equipment but i suppose some of my projects you know involve some of the most modern coolest technologies out there from wearing headsets for augmented reality to food 3d printing robotics for mimicking what people do sensors like who can say that that they can walk into work you know and you know have projects look at these type of technologies and actually seeing how they can help people on a daily basis and how you know, are there aspects that can be used to make dairy processes more sustainable by using these technologies? So, I mean, for me, it's just it's just a really interesting um, job. And the fact that I have a really nice research group also definitely helps. Um, do women make better researchers, Nora? The girls, oh, I, the, do uh, I think women in particular make different? I, that's, I, that's the question. Uh, Kenneth O'D says uh, from his his school, all the girls want to know. They're feeling very competent. Do women make better researchers? There's only one answer to this, um, I think, in this particular uh, session. Go on. What do you think? For me, I think it's down to the person. I don't specifically think a male is a better researcher over a female for the simple reasons. It's down to your own personal traits and it's down to how you want to progress, how driven you are and how interested you are in what you do. If you're not interested, I, I would say for our type of role, you do need to be good, have organ, good organizational skills, good planning skills, and be mindful of who you're working with. But definitely I wouldn't say it's down to specifically um, a man or a woman being, being a better researcher. It's down to personal traits. That's the correct answer. Um, and ding, and uh, I have a question here from Maeve Hand from she sent a question in from uh, students in Woodbrook College in Bray. Uh, do any of you work with government bodies? Maybe raise your hand. Any of you work with government bodies? Yeah, Francis. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought we were taking a poll <laughs> <Yep>. or something. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> sorry. That would be it. Um, yeah, no, it's, I suppose forestry fits into all sorts of aspects of, of science, but also just kind of land use and everything. So for that reason, I suppose even to get uh, a license to plant some trees, you, you, you work with lots of different, you know, fisheries and um, archaeological and environmental bodies, things like that. So, yeah, it's a multidisciplinary um, subject. And again, I suppose going back to that kind of, you know, where does it sit in terms of career, I think forestry or, or any of these scientific um, careers, they, they can be, you know, you, they're very transferable. You know, you don't have to kind of, I, I studied trees, that's how I, where I have to be. You've mm. such a broad kind of um, an education and experience that I think it is very transferable and, and, you know, you have opportunities for promotion, but also to transfer it to different organizations, be it public bodies or, or private, private companies. Okay, uh, Siobhan? Um, yeah, I suppose a lot of us at different stages would be working with different state bodies. I suppose the one that I would work, government body that I would work with mostly would, would be the Department of Agriculture, but also I work with Board B quite a bit. So they're one of the partners to the signpost program. And we, ha we have an agreement with them, a, a communications agreement where we, 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 we work together to try and share the farmer stories with, with a much wider audience. Um, and in terms of the department, Chagask as an organization works very closely with them in terms of rolling out schemes and that type of thing. And I suppose one role that I had a couple of years ago in terms of working with the Department of Agriculture, we had a fodder crisis back in 2018, and we would have worked very closely with the Department of Agriculture to come up with solutions to that, get over the problem, get over the problem at the time with farmers being short and fodder. So from time to time, we will have um, a lot of interaction with state bodies. Um, through our career. Uh, very good. Uh, Fanula Cork um, has sent in a question from her students. You're not going to like this one, but um, we asked. We said we were going to ask, uh, ask the questions. So students would like to know whether women get the pay, pay the same as men. Can any of you comment on that? You can raise your hand. Yeah, Deirdre? Yeah, well, Jonathan, uh, so like in Chagas, it's a state organisation. There are salary scales, so men and women get paid the same um, at the same, you know, at the same point on the scale. So, okay. Yes. So it's equal, equal, equal across current genes. Okay, that was an easy one. Uh, Nora, how long did it take to get your PhD? Um, just over three years. So actually not, well, long enough. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just over three years. Okay. Uh, and is that typical? 
Um, well, now it wouldn't be. Now you would be doing it, you know, for four years and they're usually more. I had a master's already, so that's why I could do mine in three. Um, but generally now they're they're more thought based. So there's some modules. So usually they'd be four. And then unfortunately with COVID in the last couple of years, a lot of people would have got six month extensions because they wouldn't have been allowed to go into the lab. Yeah. But generally about four Nightmare. years. Yeah. Yeah. God, I, I really do feel for the students who are who are in third level during COVID. It must have been very difficult. So um we have another question. Hi there, and thanks to all the speakers. Are there any particular areas of agriculture and climate that will provide job opportunities in the future that we might be unaware of at the moment? This is a tricky one, so I don't know who to ask that. So anybody have an answer, just open your mic. Any job opportunities in, in agriculture and climate that we're not kind of really working there at the moment, but we might in the future? Yes, Francis. Yeah. Um, well, maybe maybe we do know already, but um, definitely the direction of, of play would be in terms of carbon, you know, that that's going to be across the board, no matter what aspect of agriculture you're in. So it mightn't be per se, you know, you need to be a forester, but you need to know about the environment, you need to know how carbon works in terms of how can we capture carbon, what type of um, improvements can we make. Um, obviously, from my point of view, it's all about, you know, it's kind of trees and the benefits trees have. But um, it'll be, I suppose, the careers that will kind of be an umbrella over that in relation to how the systems work, how farms can work, how, um, you know, industries can work across the board uh, to to improve, I suppose, and to combat climate change. So that's maybe maybe it is the obvious one, but it's definitely the direction of, of play, I think, at the minute. There's so, there's so many really, isn't it? They're from, you know, working on beef, beef alternatives to improving processes like Nora's doing to, uh, you know, to researching um, different types of lands and they're, and they're optimizing their use as well. There's so many different areas that we need to improve on in, in this area. So really good question. Anyone else on that? Yep. Okay. Um, so, Siobhan, do you enjoy your career and would you recommend it to young people? You're on mute there. Um, yes, I, I genuinely enjoy my career. I have enjoyed the job I'm in. I've been very fortunate that I've switched directions three or four times since I left college. Um, and that's been down to taking advantage of the opportunities that have been put in front of me. So doing my job, but then doing something a little bit extra that will put me in a position that will open other, other doors for me. Aside from that, and I suppose I think it's a point worth making, um, I think mentors, having good mentors through your career is so important to have people. I wouldn't have called them mentors back then. They were my supervisor for my PhD or they were my line manager. But when I look back now, and the guidance they gave me at different points in my career, I realized two, I have two people in particular, and I don't want to name them, but they would have given me the guidance to push me and push me when I need to be pushed, stretch myself beyond what I was uh, doing, you know, to, to develop skills that would stand to me further down the line. Like one of the things that I really, really struggled with, I probably still do to a certain extent, was public speaking. So getting up to give a presentation, I absolutely yeah. dreaded it when I was doing my PhD. But um, my supervisor to my PhD in pig nutrition pushed me out to do presentations left, right and centre. And I used to be given out yards about doing it. But when I look back now, I realise he was doing it for a reason. He was yeah. to give me the confidence to be able to do that. Well, so I think, know, now here you are, Science Week, given a, given absolutely. a <laughs> career. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think you do need mentors. And I think it's to identify those people that will push you in the right direction and that you'll trust the advice that they'll give you and and I think probably yeah. I'm sure Deirdre Francis and Nora will all have people that they'll think back on in their career that helps them to get to where they are so um I think it's important for students to identify those people early on in their career as well and, 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 right and, and they could be teachers as well absolutely um, thanks very much for that Siobhan um quick one for you Francis this is from North Wicklow Educates Together Secondary School what are the advantages of monoculture plantation Oh, okay. Um, well, advantages. Um, anything that's in monoculture is easier to manage. That's that's the reason why they are there. Um, of course, there's there's pros and cons. Um, but in a quick quick answer, that that's the main reason. Um, easy to management. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, Ursuline College in Sligo want to ask uh, when were you in roles managing people? When you were in roles managing people, what skills did you need to be effective? So anyone. Over, over managing teams, Deirdre, uh, Nora, what sort of? Yeah, so really important skill when you're managing people is communication. You have to have good communication so that the team functions well. 
Um, That's very listening different. as well as uh, listening as well listening, as talking. Yeah, right? yeah, actively listening, Jonathan, um, as well as you know, it's a two-way thing. Quite different skill set to to research, and I suppose that sometimes researchers can be almost if you think if you think of some of the cartoon things you know a researcher working in a lab scientists working in a lab on their own doing their thing and I suppose sometimes as scientists we can feel a little bit like that uh, we're not trained to be managers but a lot of the skills that make a good researcher will make a good manager once they can be I suppose adapted and 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 um uh, yeah, adapted to to suit the management role, but it is management is a skill in itself that you have to yeah. work on, and uh, you know, and and do maybe do a course in it. Is you know, we're not all born to be managers, so no, I, I, do, I, I, do courses in management and leadership to make you a better leader of your team and manager of your team. Absolutely, it it, it is. Um, it's something that people just find themselves in sometimes, and yeah. you, you find yourself managing teams, and it's not a skill, but it, that you've been taught. But it's a skill yeah. that's very important. Well, guys, thank you so much uh, for all of your questions. We hope you enjoyed today's event. Thanks to all of my guests from Chagas, Deirdre Hennessy, Nora O'Shea, Francis McHugh, and Siobhan Kavanagh, um, and to all the Chagas organizers behind the scenes, especially Katrina Boyle and Tiernan, Neve Dillon, Katie, Dace, uh, Katie Casey, and Gail Moore. Thanks as well to Emma Fogarty from the Gender Smart project. This event was made possible by Science Foundation Ireland and Chagas. Check out chagas.ie to find out more about upcoming Science Week events and other events uh, at, at, at on Chagask. And uh, we'll be featuring all of the videos from the week and the live Zoom recordings on the Chagask Zoom channel, uh, the, sorry, the YouTube channel, as well as the uh, Chagask website. So thanks so much for coming. And I hope you have a great Science Week. We hope you can join us for some of our upcoming science events at BT Young Scientists in the IDS in January and ESB Science Blast in February. We hope to see you then. Have a great Science Week. And sorry to everyone who we didn't get to, uh, to answer their question. Uh, there's just so many coming in. So thanks so much for your engagement and we'll see you next time.